Hi everyone, I'm looking forward to our FaceTime session in a little bit, but thank you to Jose for getting things set up for us today and letting us use his computer. And hopefully you're able to access things very easily. And remember that this is on YouTube if you want to watch it later on your own. So let's pick up where we left off. We were looking at social learning and we had discussed imitation where an individual performs a new behavior and it has to involve spatial manipulation. And there has to be some goal, like maybe a food reward. And then we talked about copying. And remember in copying, the animal is repeating a behavior that it sees, but it doesn't have to be a novel behavior and it also doesn't have to involve spatial manipulation. And we talked finally about the guppy example where an observer female might end up copying the behavior of a model who expresses a preference, whether she has it or not, for a particular male. And of course, in this case, the observers chose which male the female guppy would be next to. And then finally, we saw an example in mice in the lab of the same thing. And so with that, we can go ahead and move forward. So in Emo's troop, if we think about it, was that imitation? or copying. Well, when Emo initially discovered the behavior of dropping rice into water so the rice would float and the sand would sink to the bottom, then the other animals would have been imitating, right? Because it would have been a new spatial manipulation that they had never done before. But later on, when she was simply washing sweet potato, then maybe we actually had copying. So something that's relatively new in the study of animal behavior is the idea of traditions. And so this is the idea that a social group would develop a preference that becomes common in the group, something that hadn't really existed before. And researchers experimented with this idea with meerkats. What they did with the meerkats is they had two locations where there was a watering hole where the animals could drink. And both were equally good they trained one meerkat to prefer a particular landmark. And you can look at the real landmarks that they used in the pictures in your book. But they were just arbitrary objects. But they trained one individual to prefer a landmark. And then when they introduced the landmarks at the two watering holes, the individual that preferred, say, the yellow cylinder, it went to the area with the yellow cylinder. And all of the other meerkats followed. But because there wasn't really a reward associated with one landmark versus the other, over time, the tradition faded. So it was sort of a fad that initially the meerkats thought the landmark was really important for knowing the watering hole was there. But in a short period of time, they realized it didn't really matter that both landmarks were equally good. So it was a short-term tradition. And just like a fad, the trend faded in a short period of time. So let's think about teaching in animals. We've been talking about imitating, copying, and social learning. But what about the specific case of teaching in animals, where one individual really is serving as an instructor or teacher, and the other one acts as a student? So the teacher takes an active role and it's providing an immediate benefit to the students. It doesn't have any immediate benefit to themselves, so it's not like they're also being helped by the behavior. And information is imparted more quickly than if the student was just learning on their own. So like you come to classes, you learn things that maybe you could have learned from a textbook, but you're able to grasp and access them more quickly when you have a good teacher. And so that information is imparted faster. The teacher doesn't receive an immediate benefit necessarily. So as an example, cheetahs will serve as teachers to their own young. And so I think you know that cheetahs will capture prey, and when they do have young, they'll actually bring the prey back to their own offspring and let their offspring sort of pretend kill that prey animal. So the antelope really already is dead, but the cheetah mom allows her pups to you know, pretend that they're capturing that prey and they're getting practice. And really at that young age, the only prey that they're able to successfully capture because they're inexperienced is something as small as a rabbit or a hare. 
A more interesting example in my mind are meerkat helpers. So meerkats live in big groups of related individuals, and there's usually one breeding female that is having all the offspring during a particular time frame, but other individuals will help to raise the young. And they do things like train the young meerkat pups how to find and successfully obtain food. So they'll do things like presenting the pup with the type of food that the pup has never used before, um, eaten before. And then they'll also monitor the feeding behavior. So can you tell in this picture that the pup is actually kind of wrestling with a scorpion, isn't it? Can you imagine if the scorpion wanders off? It has that tail that has to be disabled so that the meerkat isn't stung. And so the helper shows the pup how to deal with new kinds of prey. And if the prey does wander off, then they'll retrieve it, bring it back, and let the pup try at it again. And so really they're modifying food as well, like removing the stinger, in order to show the pup how that kind of food has to be tackled. And given that some pups may be neophobic, so we have neophilic is being very interested in new things, neophobic is being afraid or wary of new things. If there is a pup who is neophobic, then they'll encourage those reluctant pups to eat. No, really, this is food, try it out. So another activity to think about modes of cultural transmission. So imagine in your mind a social group of elephants, several generations of female elephants and their young. So several generations, let's call it three generations. And so you sort of have grandmother, mother, and then the youngest generation of elephants. And then you could draw arrows pointing at who might be sharing information with whom. So how would information being transmitted between the generations? So if you did that, then you would have maybe three different layers. And within that, you could have vertical transmission. So vertical transmission is just like it sounds, from grandmother to her child, right, to her offspring, that would be the mother generation of elephant, from mothers to those granddaughter elephants. Uh, and then in addition to that, couldn't we have vertical transmission upward? which is what happened in Emo's group, is that Emo was a young monkey, a young macaque, and she actually transmitted information up to her mother and to her own grandmother. And so let's look at sort of the other ways in which information could be transmitted. We have vertical, sort of from one generation down and down and down. We could also have from grandmother directly down to granddaughter, couldn't we? How about horizontal? Horizontal is going to be information being transmitted within the same generation. And so sisters sharing information with sisters or grandmothers sharing information with other individuals of the grandmother generation. Oblique is a word that means diagonal. And so in oblique transmission, we would have maybe transmission instead of from mother to her own offspring, maybe it would be from a distant aunt to her niece. So we have kind of a sideways diagonal transmission. And you may have heard that word oblique before in the musculature in the body, that there are the external obliques and they have the muscle fibers that run kind of diagonal. So if you've done some dissections, then that might be a word that helps you to connect. So oblique means instead of directly from grandmother to mother to granddaughter, that we have sort of sideways transmission where it might be from an aunt to a niece. All right. So here's a couple of examples of vertical transmission. We know that definitely some birds transmit songs from parent to offspring. 
and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But interestingly, in Shark Bay, Australia, there's a population of dolphins where females teach their daughters how to hunt at the beach. So basically they swim in a group and they end up herding shoals of fish towards the shallows. And once the fish are in the shallows, then they're very easy for the dolphins to consume. Another thing that these same dolphins do, and again, it's transmitted from mothers to their offspring, so it's vertical transmission, is that they find sponges, natural sea sponges, which are animals, right? And they'll pick them up off the bottom and then they'll use them to protect their snouts while they poke around at the bottom of the water, hoping to scare a fish. And so there's sharp coral pieces that'll damage the snout, but with a sponge on there, the sponge serves as protection, and then they can push around, nose around, scare a fish, drop the sponge and grab the fish. I think that this is a really neat experiment. So this is an example of horizontal transmission, transmission within a generation. What these experimenters did is the typical psychology experiment. So if you're not going to teach something to salivate when it hears a bell, you're not going to teach it to push a button to get a treat, then the other thing that you do is make it run a maze. And so they had a complicated aquarium maze. And in the maze, there were two different ways to swim through the maze to get to a food source. And one of the ways was very long in terms of swimming time and distance. The other one was much shorter, and they had two groups of guppies, and one group of guppies, they taught one route about how to get to that food. The other group of guppies, they led along and taught them the other route. So one school of fish knew the short route, and the other school of fish only knew the long way. And then they very gradually, they had, you know, schools of guppies that knew one way or the other way. Very gradually, they would remove an experienced trained guppy and replace it with a novice guppy that didn't have any information. And they did that fish by fish by fish until the whole school now was composed of new fish that had never swam in the training portion of the maze. And what they found is that even when all of the fish who had participated in training had been removed, that the sort of new school only knew the way through the maze that that school had been trained. And so there had been horizontal transmission within the generation so that fish that were in the long route school, even though they hadn't done the training, they had learned it from being with other fish in their school, running the maze to find the food. And then finally, oblique transmission. And so thinking about generation to generation, uh, but not necessarily from parent to offspring or grandparent to offspring, there was an experiment done with monkeys, actually, and monkeys have an innate fear of snakes. And so it's built in evolutionarily. For monkeys, there is always an advantage to staying away from snakes. Whether they're poisonous snakes or not, it's advantageous for a monkey to stay away. And so that actually has evolved as a innate behavior that monkeys are fearful of snakes and they try to avoid them. But <laughs> in addition to that, Experience with snakes causes monkeys to become even more fearful. And so if you compare sort of their base level of wariness around snakes to what it's like after they've received information about being afraid of snakes, then they show much more fearful behavior after the training. So what the researchers did is they took video of monkeys being afraid of snakes and they showed that video to other monkeys. And they were not monkeys that were directly relatives, but they were monkeys of the same species. And just from watching those videos of monkeys they didn't know being afraid of a snake, then even without having personally encountered snakes in the past, the monkeys that did this training were much more fearful. And so they had their innate response was reinforced by watching the video to produce an even more fearful behavior. So we've seen modes of cultural transmission, uh, whether it's vertical from one generation to the next within the family, whether it's horizontal, sort of within individuals of the same age class, the same age generation, and oblique that could be from less related individuals and in sort of a diagonal transmission. And of course, there's a genetic basis for phenotype 
which is behavior, but there's also a genetic base for the ability to learn. And so just like we saw in the monkeys, they have an innate basis for being afraid of snakes, but there's also a genetic basis for their ability to learn to have an even more fearful response. And so we see that there's an interaction between the cultural transmission of behavior and that learning, and then also genetics. And I wanna show you an example of that. And so now we're gonna go back to Song in Finch. And we're gonna to go to the Galapagos Islands, which if you're interested in the Galapagos, you should talk to Bertha, she's in our class, she went last year. And she saw all the different animals that you always hear about in the Galapagos Islands. So the famous couple that studied the medium ground finch, especially in the Galapagos for their entire career are Peter and Rosemary Grant. And they still have students and, you know, grand students going to the Galapagos today to continue to collect data on this sort of iconic animal. And so here is the medium ground finch. So write down your guess. If song is culturally transmitted, what do you think would be the relationship or correlation? Would it be a positive, negative, or no correlation between an individual bird's song and his father's song? And if song is culturally transmitted, what would be the relationship between a bird's song and his paternal grandfather's song, so his dad's dad's song? And then what would you expect the correlation to be if it's culturally transmitted between a bird's song and his maternal grandfather's song? And while you're thinking about this, remember that it's only male birds that sing the song because it's a, a intersexual selection song, right? To attract a female. So let's do the same thing, but now what would your prediction be if song is genetically transmitted? And I should have said on this that what you could do is besides each of these, write down A, B, and C, and then you could put a positive, a negative, or a, a I don't know, a null symbol that it's none. So if song is genetically transmitted, what should be the relationship between a bird's song and his dad's song? A bird's song and his paternal grandfather's song, so that's his dad's dad, or his maternal grandfather's song, his mom's dad's song. So first we did culturally transmitted, and then in this case, what if it's genetically transmitted? What correlations do you expect? What do you think of that graph? So what we're looking at here is the correlation between father and son. How similar are the songs? And what you see here is a strong positive correlation. And so it looks like a son song is related in some way to his father's song. And so that tells us that there's some mode of transmission, right? So the son is either inheriting the song through genetics, or the son is learning the song from his father. What about this one? Here we're looking at the son and his paternal grandfather, his dad's dad. And so if song is genetically based, there should be a correlation here because paternal grandfather passed on genes to dad who passed on genes to son. But the correlation shouldn't be as strong because we will have had paternal grandmother's influence and we will have mother's influence because she would be passing on the song genes even though she doesn't sing. If it were culturally, culturally transmitted, well, where would dad have learned his song? Dad would have learned his song from his dad. And so if grandfather sang to dad and dad sang to son and song was culturally transmitted, we would also expect to see some correlation here. So we have positive correlation, but we have one more comparison to make, right? The son versus the maternal grandfather. And here it is. Wow. <laughs> here it looks like a slight negative correlation, but I don't think that's statistically significant. So look at for each value of maternal grandfather song, you really have no idea what to expect from the son. So maternal grandfather's value could be very low and son's value could be very high. Or we could find that maternal grandfather's number is very high and son's could be low or high or somewhere that's totally average. So it looks here like there's really no relationship between the son as his, and his mom's dad.
Now, if song was genetically transmitted, then shouldn't there be some influence of his mom's dad? Mom's dad would have passed on song genes to mother, and mother would have passed them on to son. Even though mom doesn't sing, she would still have the genes. But we don't see any relationship. And so here's what we see. That the relationship between a bird's song and his father's song was strongly positive. The relationship between the bird's song and his dad's dad's song was positive, but a little bit less so. And the bird's song and his maternal grandfather's song, no relationship whatsoever. And so it looks like song is, in fact, culturally transmitted. Had it been genetically transmitted, then there should have also been a relationship between a finch's song and his maternal grandfather's song, but there is not. So here's one, one final piece to this puzzle. The ability, oh, this is the hypothesis. I was gonna ask you to write the hypothesis, but I'm supposed to ask you to draw the graph. So the ability to culturally transmit information is gonna be dependent on brain size. Draw a graph that you think would show the correlation between cultural transmission of information and brain size. Did you get the independent and dependent variables, right? So brain ratio would be something just that we measure, how big is the brain? And you can see here that the graphs are labeled executive brain ratio. So the idea is they've removed out the size of the brain stem, the things that take care of involuntary function have been removed. And we really have just here the thinking part of the brain. And so the bigger the thinking part of the brain, the higher the number on the x-axis. And then what we're looking at on the y-axis is it's basically a measurement of the ability to socially learn. And of course, you see a positive correlation in both of the ways that this was expressed. And so whether it's for innovation or whether it's for social learning, you can see that as brain size goes up, the learning thinking part of the brain, then we also have a corresponding increase in the ability to be innovative or the ability to learn socially. And so these data come from 100 non-human primates, so from monkeys and apes. And then there are similar data actually for birds, and we'll talk about some of the really clever things that birds do in a future lecture. And I think that that's gonna wrap up our lecture for today. We've talked about cultural transmission. We had some definitions. We talked about the effects of others in ways that are not considered social learning. And then we talked about modes of cultural transmission, genetics versus cultural influence. And then we followed up with brain size. And so that wraps up today's lecture. And I will be ready to FaceTime with you at, oh, what time is our class? 11. At 11.30, we'll start our FaceTime. Thanks.